Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, it's a real uh, pleasure for me to be able to come and talk a little bit about um, my course today. So that, this is going to be a very straight up talk. I mean, it's, it, uh, this is the first time I've given it. In fact, it, it, I wrote most of this this morning. Um, so I'm just going to literally talk you through um, my experience, okay, of what happened. So bef before I do that, so this is a, rush, a rundown then of what I'm planning to do today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about who I am because it's kind of important to for you in understanding why I did what I did. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about my course and how it was. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about why I wanted to flip it uh, and my concerns before I flip my course. Uh, and then uh, the sort of middle section will be on how did I do the flip, how did I implement it, and then a little bit at the end, um, you know, how, what was it like, what did I learn from the experience. So that's, that's very, very kind of straight structure that I'm going to go through today. So I'm, uh, as you heard from Brigham, I, I teach on the PEAK program. And I basically teach a lot of courses on PEAK, uh, but I, I teach chemistry courses in PEAK to all four, uh, so I teach all four years of undergraduate. I have at least one chemistry course in each year. Uh, I also teach graduate courses here as well. And I, I, I have a lot of background. I work, when I worked in the UK, I had a lot of experience teaching high school students as well. So I'm very aware of the bridge between high school chemistry and university chemistry. And uh, I worked as a senior lecturer in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Leicester in the UK for about seven years uh, and taught various chemistry courses there. And one of the big things that I did when I was there was I was one of the founder members of a degree program we had there called iScience, which was an interdisciplinary science degree taught entirely by problem-based learning. So there were no lectures, there was no conventional learning at all. So the whole degree was taught by um, problem-based learning. And based on my experiences in that, I also then introduced problem-based learning to our chemistry department and started that. And now as, uh, we did that just before I left and moved to Japan, and that's still continuing quite successfully there. Um, and in terms of this, the course, I, I also, before I moved to the University of Tokyo, I taught at Tokyo Institute of Technology, and particularly taught a course on quantum mechanics there. So that's a little bit of background. Um, and this is the course that I teach uh, for, to our first year PEAK students, all right? So this um, is a foundation or compulsory course. So every PEAK student uh, who's doing our environmental sciences course has to take this course. Um, and it's also the first chemistry class of their degree, okay? So it's really the, an introduction, <laughs> as given away by the title. Um, and so I'm gonna just in, stick a couple of slides up from my class here so you can see it. So when I'm introducing the course, um, uh, really, I, uh, right at the beginning, I'm talking about what chemistry is, and the course is really about physical chemistry. All right, so uh, for those of you who are scientists, so physical chemistry is the rules and principles of chemistry based on the laws of physics and written in the language of mathematics. So what I want you to understand is this is very, very core material. Um, and what I cover in the course then are... Um, so this, this, this shows you kind of the structure of the subject, but anyone who's interested in chemistry will know that, that, that really there are kind of three big foundations to how the, the rules of chemistry work, and they're based on these ideas, quantum mechanics, okay, thermodynamics, and statistical mechanics. There are lots of other things, but they kind of underpin everything, and they're the big ideas. And so when I originally designed this course, the goal of my course was to try and introduce students to the, only the basics of these, but, but, but also the basics done in a very thorough uh, and, and systematic way. Not, 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 a very, not, not simplistic, not oversimplified. The stuff is difficult, done properly, but I don't try and cover everything. But I wanted to cover all these things. So what that means is uh, it's a very high content course. Lots and lots of new ideas, really big new ideas, lots and lots of difficult ideas, and uh, all the kind of key concepts in chemistry. And originally when I designed this course, I used the 13 lecture sessions that we have, and I would give primarily a conventional lecture, all right? Using some of the tricks I'd learned over the years, but none of the great kind of integrated problem-based stuff that I'd been working on in the UK. This was a straight-up lecture, content delivery. 
It was interactive. I'd stop. I'd allow students to interact, ask questions, etc. I'd use lecture breaks, innovative lecture breaks where I could, but it was pretty much a straight-up class. And then uh, outside class, what students would do is I'd use our online VLE to uh, give them online quizzes that they could take to practice the ideas outside class, and I'd provide them with model answers, and I'd give them written questions as well, and give them model answers for that. Um, so it was a very conventional course. Um, and of course, online I'd have other materials, links to videos, examples, extra questions, things like that. So it was a kind of well-structured course, but very conventional. Uh, and the, this was assessed generally by two kind of midterm sets of problems that I would set the students to do that I would mark and grade that constituted 30% along with attendance and an exam that was worth 70% of the mark at the end. So that was the, that was the existing structure. Um, so the big question then is why did I decide that I wanted to flip this class? All right. Um, before I flipped my class, the course was really successful. All right. It, it worked well. Students, students were generally doing well on the course, um, and the student feedback was very, very good. Uh, I had actually no, no sense of dissatisfaction from the students with the course. Secondly, yeah, okay, so it was well received by the students as well. This was, it was not a course I was having a lot of pro obvious problems with. However, I definitely felt like um, the students could do better. I didn't think I was serving them all. We always have those great, bright students who will survive and do well no matter how terrible your course is, <laughs> all right? Um, I think many elite universities have traditionally been based on that concept. Um, but um, I thought the students could do better. I really, I really did. I thought more of them, I thought I could push the level of them up. Um, and I was working very hard at that time. We had an, some extra workshop classes that we'd sneakily hidden into another course to help students with this, which was giving them extra time. And we, I was devoting a whole lunch time each week in addition where students could come and talk to me and ask questions and I could spend face-to-face -face time working on their problems with them. And this, this was great and I was happy to do it uh, even though I was busy, but the problem was it was very unevenly distributed. Only a few students would come and they got kind of a better treatment if they came along. Now that was up to them to choose, but I wanted to be able to have that level of interaction with all the students in the class. That was that was really one of the strong motivations for this. So I wanted to spend more time really getting the students to think about and work through key concepts. That I didn't know if that was happening. I was giving the class, they were doing the other stuff themselves at home. I didn't really know uh, what they were struggling with. Um, and also, I very, very much wanted to get on into some problem-based, team-based activities because I'd seen how effective it was when I was in the UK. And I kind of, I guess I suffered a, a lapse of, of confidence when I, when I first moved to the University of Tokyo. I didn't feel confident enough to bring my unusual teaching methods from the UK with me. I thought, when I started, I thought I need to give her a course that will be expected in the University of Tokyo style. So I did. But as I spent more time here and grew more confident, I then thought, hang on, now, now I know everything's okay. I can now do what I want to do in my classroom. So... Those were the kind of motivations behind my class. What was I worried about? Because actually I thought about this for a long time before I did the flip. And I'd been umming and aahing, and many of you I spoke to about this. But I actually only had one real fear. Uh, there was only one thing that I could think of that would be a problem, and that would be, would they watch the videos? This, uh, this was my real concern. Because I, I was planning to really flip the class completely and take all the lecture material entirely out of the classroom. And each class would then be, would require the students to have watched the lecture to be of any use. Otherwise, I would just want to send them home. It would have been useless to them. And I was nervous. I was like, will they really watch it? I know how busy the students are. I was concerned about this. So this was my big thing. How was I going to deal with that? But that was really my only worry about flipping the class. Um, and so... Finally, I decided that I was going to do this. I'd spent some time visiting some educational conferences, talking to many people, and I'd become confident that I could find a way around this. Um, and so after that, I realized there's two major tasks to take my existing class and to flip it. And the first one, obviously, was to get all my, all my video material, uh, all my lecture material into video. 
All right. Uh, and then the second part was, once you realize you've done that, I then had 13 times 105 minute sessions that were now completely empty. All right, so, it's, so now you've got to uh, f completely fill that, that gap. Okay, so it's, that's really almost like designing an entirely new course. But for me, it was the, the joy of it. It was because that was where I could start doing the interactive stuff. Okay. So um, first of all, let me tell you about recording the lectures. Now, sadly, when I uh, did this, I wasn't aware of any resources or anything that I could leverage or, or uh, the CC producer, etc. I actually had a meeting about, found out about uh, after I'd already completed and already flipped my course. And that, those kind of resources are exceptionally useful. Um, so what did I do? I decided, I was planning well in advance. I waited, when I delivered this course in 2015, I got some money from GFD to hire a student uh, uh, to basically record it. So what it did was I moved my, my course that year from a normal classroom into CALS, which is our active learning studio, which is very well set up and has cameras that we can use, et cetera, and other resources for recording, and also very nice staff from CALS who could you know, uh, also help and provide, help me with those resources. And they provided the cameras and audio recorder. And then I got some funding from our global faculty development program to, for a TA who I was just going to use a student to record the lectures. So actually, I, my PhD, a PhD student from my research, own research group, Lewis, until sadly he's, he's away in Hokkaido this weekend, um, he, he actually came and recorded all the lectures. Um, and I recorded all 13 lectures on the course. So that, that was done in, in the summer of 2015. Okay, um, the next big step was how I was gonna edit that material. Um, and I had a number of thoughts on this. Uh, there were lots of decisions to make. Uh, one of the things you, you heard earlier, the, your, your, your model, for example, with the three sitting around the table, is a, is a very effective one, I think. And uh, uh, individual talking heads or, and, and very focused things like that, student, it's, there's a lot of data to show that students really do lose attention, I think, and things like that. And, and what, the, what a lot of the literature says was that actually real lectures are very good. You know, where, especially where the, 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 the teacher is interacting with a real class. Um, it, it keep, the, the, the student, the, when you watch it, you almost feel like you're a member of the class. Uh, and also, because there's a natural interaction and questions from the floor, I decided to leave most of that in. So I left mistakes in, you know, and commented on them, and I left students' questions in, in places, and my responses to them. Um, and I got, <laughs> so Claire's hiding now. So this is, this is Claire Chong. She's one of our currently third year uh, peak students now. She was a is that, yeah, that you were a first year in 2015. She actually took the course. She was one of the students taking the course when I recorded it, so she knew all the material well. She knew what it was about. Um, and uh, she agreed to act as an RA and was, with her nifty video editing skills, uh, was able to edit the videos down, and she did some really cool things. So we, combi we had two cameras. We combined the footage depending on where I was, depending on what shot. And she also, I gave her a copy of all the lecture slides, and what she did was she incorporated the slides into the videos when necessary. Where I had video content in the lecture, she imported those feeds directly. So she went through and slavishly edited all 13 times 105 minutes worth of material, which was uh, incredible. So I'm just gonna show you a little uh, clip. So at the end, each video is about 80 minutes long. Now this is really long, but these, these were full lectures. And this, this, was, this was my aim, was not to produce little video segments. This is the whole course on video, and, and the whole class time is then switched. Um, so I'm gonna just show you a little clip from one uh, to show you uh, a number of features hopefully I captured in this clip. So. this in more detail again in the next uh, workshop class, but this is revision really. We're going to start just making sure, I'm not going to spend the next, next week's lecture telling you why class core mechanics doesn't work. I thought you'd better check, you'd better check first of all you know what class core mechanics is, and then I can tell you it's wrong. 
Um, but like, let's just go back and review a few important ideas. Hopefully you've studied in physics before or not, maybe. Um, I want to just point out some really important things. Is, this is a snooker. I don't know if you ever watched snooker on TV. I have the things up my blue. That's a nice shot. <laughs> Snooker is that when we have these balls on the table, they obey, they obey a set of laws. And we know what those laws are very well, and we can write down equations for them, and we also intuitively know, right? So a good snooker player is someone who can tell what angle to use, how, hit, how hard to hit the ball, how much spin to put on the ball, to plan where the balls will go afterwards. But for that to work, they have to be reproducible. In other words, if the player plays exactly the same shot twice, in other words, if he hits the ball at exactly the same point with the same amount of spin and the same power, etc., the ball should do the same thing. That's deterministic. We mentioned this word before. This is the case, all right? Uh, and then and this, is, this is how things work. If I throw this to you and ask you to catch it, all right, you can, right? And, and if I... If I Take any object, all right? Then we can actually plot out a path for this object. If you know where it started, if you know how hard I throw it, in which direction, if there's any air resistance, things like that, physics. I think you probably studied that in physics this semester, motion mechanics. If you know all the forces, you can work out what it's going to do. The fact that you can do that on paper means it does the same thing every time. All right, so that's good. And in physics, we talk about objects then having trajectories. The trajectory of something is basically a mathematical equation that says if we know where it is at this point in time, and we know all the forces acting on it, then we can say exactly where it will be at any future point in time, and we know exactly how fast it will be moving in one direction and so on. All right, so that's the idea in physics. So classical mechanics is all about trajectories. Objects behave in a very, very predictable way. <coughs> So perhaps you play Angry Birds. Yeah, I'm sure you have. But it's a classic example. In principle, if you, if you make exactly the same shot in Angry Birds, then you'll get exactly the same result. But it, the idea is the fine tuning is quite important. Yeah. Okay. So I hope you can see in that video that there are a number of things. Uh, actually, we have a kind of broad camera for the whole room. We have uh, zooming and panning of me when I'm moving around, because I move around quite a lot, and I went and interact with the students quite a lot during, during the class. Um, and that was included. The video that I had, in, you, you saw that it instantly smoothly went into the direct feed. And also, uh, whenever I had important things on the PowerPoint slides, you get a proper a high resolution version of that in the video, so you're not trying to read it off the actual screen. Um, so that was the structure that we used for the video, and again, thanks to Claire, because it was her hard work that made that possible. Uh, so my plan then, uh, after recording the videos, was to think, what was I going to do in the class? And after much kind of research and thinking, I settled on um, uh, the pre-class activities working like this. So the students would be given a link to the video one week uh, before the class, and I also give them da downloadable PDFs uh, in a full screen one that they can look at on their iPad or whatever, and also one that's suitable for printing out. Um, and they're required to watch the video before attending the class, and I'll talk about uh, how I ensured that later. Uh, they're, told that they should take, they, they're told that they should treat this as if they were in a real lecture. So they're expected to take notes uh, while, while they're watching the lecture. And they're supposed to write a list of things they don't understand or have questions about that they can ask me about during the, the class session. And then the key thing really was, how was my new class structure going to be? And it varied from class to class slightly, but the basic structure was this. 
I would start off, uh, I originally planned to start off with a quiz, but for various reasons, as I'll highlight, I, I changed to moving to a team activity from the beginning. So basically, the students would come in, they were assigned to teams for the entire course, um, and they were in teams of four or five. I had four groups of four or five, so I, had, I think I had 17 students in total. And they would go and I would give them an activity to work on. They would work on it as a team for about 35 minutes. Uh, and during that time, um, I would go round. I was free. I could go and sit with each group. I could ask them questions. I could check that they were understanding the concepts and I'd move among them. Um, then we'd take a break. And then what I would do is I would have an interactive quiz. So I'd set them a quiz on the computer and they, uh, and they, they responded, um, as I'll explain in a minute. Um, and then after that, we'd go back and have a second team activity for the second half of the class. So they'd work on a different set of problems for the second half. And again, I'd move around and talk to them. So that was the rough structure of my classes. Um, I want to tell you about the different bits then. So the first one was the interactive quiz. When I was in the UK, I did a lot of work with schools. And I had used clickers uh, when I did schoolwork. I'd never actually used them in my university teaching. Uh, but I was very keen to try it, but I never really had any access to a set of clickers here. And then I discovered um, uh, that, that, that there was a way around that. The motivation for the quiz was, well, there were no, my main one when I started was that I wanted to make sure the students have watched the video. So the idea was I would ask them questions from the video, and I would very quickly be able to tell whether they'd watched it or not. Um, and also, uh, so the quiz was, was typically five to ten questions. They were multiple choice, true or false, short answers, but co all kind of deep concept based, sometimes calculation based. Um, and I made this work worth 10% of the course. So I think this is very important. It, it had to count. So the students knew that if they did the video, watched the videos and could answer the quiz questions, they would, they, they would actually uh, count for their, their, their course mark. And the delivery then was using a tool called Socrative. So I've talked about this a number of times here, uh, but uh, this was really kind of a bit of a revelation for me, as I'll say later. But Socrative is, a, is, a, is a, a currently still free uh, software that you can use that allows the students to use their laptops or their mobile phones to interact with you in real time. And what, what the joy with Socrative was, was I'd never used it. I had no idea if it was going to work, but it's so simple and it's very robust. I went into the first class, I, I introduced the students, I tried to get them all, I checked they all amazingly had mobile phones or some kind of device that they could connect with. And within about five minutes, I had every student registered on the system and I did the first quiz and it was seamless. And ever since then, I've had such confidence in using Socrative that I never worry about it. It just, you can go in and so. Uh, so that was how I did the quizzes. The other important thing uh, that I wanted to introduce was for the, for the team-based interactive activities. Now this is a system called POGIL. I don't know if you've all heard of this. It stands for Process Oriented Guided Inquiry Learning. It's very similar to the, a lot of the problem-based learning activities that I'd done in the UK. Uh, so you can see this is some of the promotional slides from their website. Um, what I would very much like to do is I've got some of my, I used Pogil uh, for all the kind of t, uh, Pogil type things. I did some of my own. I used existing resources. Here is just some samples of worksheets that the, the, that the students worked on in the class together as teams. I just hand these around and, and take a look. Um, and so um, I used a variety of sources, as I said. Uh, one of the big ones for the quantum mechanics for me was this book that already exists, and it's full of these activities. And they've been very carefully considered and, and developed. Um, and what I did was I took the materials for that, and I tailored them to match the time and the details of my course. Um, and basically, what I would do then in the group session is I would give each group an activity sheet, just one. They didn't get a copy each. They had one, one of them, and they had to work on it as a team. Uh, and they had to, they had to uh, write all their answers, et cetera, on there. Uh, so four groups of sort of four or five students, and they worked together on it um, and complete the worksheet together. And then um, uh, what, what I would ask them to do, 
so that they all had a record themselves, because I wanted them to give me these sheets so that I could grade them. As they completed them, they all just used their mobile phones to, to keep a copy of it, so that they could, they could have their own copy of it. But I didn't give them their own sheets to complete. I wanted very much this to be a team exercise. Um, OK, and so then for the course assessment, I changed it from previously. Um, I basically gave 10% for the in-class quizzes. There was 25% for the group work in Pogil, 25% of the course. So they, they would do one or two uh, worksheets um, in each class, uh, and then 65% for the final exam. Um, and the group work, probably one of the questions you often get asked about is how do you how do you ass assess group work and how do you do it fairly? How do you make sure you know, that there's not one student getting all the marks for all the other students? So I'll, I'm actually going to just show you um, each group at, in every class submitted their Pogel workshops and they submitted um, an assessment of their group. All right, so let me show you the actual uh, uh, notes. And the marks then, the group marks that I got from marking were scaled to the stu individual students based on the evaluations done by the group. So let me just quickly show you the notes. Uh, the, the, this is uh, my notes to the student explaining to them how to use it. Each student would fill in one of these. Uh, which week it was, they had to write their name and the mem other names of all the other members of the group, and they had to give a score to each student. And the goal was that the sum of all the scores had to be zero. All right? OK. So. I, I would give them some examples, so a normal contribution, if someone's contributing normally to the group, they score zero. If someone is really slacking, they get negative points, and if someone is doing all the work, they get positive points, but the total number of points for the group had to be zero. They were private, they didn't share them with each other, they didn't have to, there was no way anyone could find out what each student had marked, and uh, this is what I did. So here were some examples. Um, one star and one slacker. Um, you are Albert Einstein, gets plus one, and uh, average Joe, average Jane, and both give a normal contribution and get zero, and lazy bones gets minus one, so the total is zero. Um, and then uh, someone leads the way. We've got Albert Einstein now with his one and three of them scoring minus a third. Uh, or, and this then, I, what I said to the students is, if your team is working, this is what you want. I want to see this, right? This is where you need to get to. That's the goal for every group, that everyone's contributing evenly. Um, OK. So the other kind of big change I made to my course, uh, and now I'm almost running out of time, but um, was I, I'd often wanted, I, I really lo loathe making students pay for textbooks. Uh, it drives me mad. So I, I had been thinking about trying to move over, and I, 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 I went to a lecture on it when I was at the Pacific Chem Conference in Hawaii, and I found out in details about the Chem Wiki, which was hosted by University of California at Davis. It's actually now, <laughs> I went to look for it for this lecture, and it's gone. Um, it's now been renamed. It's now called the Chemistry Libre Text, okay? but it's the same material. And what's nice about that is it's easy and free access for students. Uh, they can access the textbook on their mobile phone, which is really nice. It means they can look at it any time. It's zero cost. Uh, what it, they have this really nice feature. They have a core collection of material, and they also have these text maps. So if you've used famous, say, physical chemistry textbooks, what these do is they have all the chapters and all the material arranged in the same way as, the, as particular textbooks. So that, that's really a, a nice feature of those. And what was really great was each week, for each class on the VLE, I could just provide a web link to the relevant chapter. Uh, so I could direct the students reading very easily through that. Okay, so uh, I need to dash on. Uh, basically, everything was delivered by our VLE, which is called ITCLMS. This is a typical session six pre-class material. So there's the video for them to read. There's the notes, and the, there's the notes. There's some uh, additional notes. There's printable versions, and there's textbook chapter, etc. That was a typical uh, resources. Um, the required work each week was to watch the lecture, as I said. But I also always gave them optional additional readings, video readings, uh, uh, videos, and uh, self-check quizzes for them to use. So there was lots and lots of additional material if they wanted to use it as well. Um, OK, so in the last five minutes, then, let me tell you what I found out. Um, my own perception 
what I discovered was that the combination of the teamwork and the responsibility for that and the in-class quizzes meant that every student watched every video every week. I didn't have a single case where they didn't do that. So my biggest fear was not realized. They, it really worked. Um, also, attendance was remarkable. I mean, I think I had like one student miss one or two sessions because they were sick. But basically, every student came to every class. Uh, kind of makes sense. Um, what I loved was I got so much time interacting with the students. I could go, I could talk to them as a group, I could talk to them individually, I could really find out what they didn't understand. Um, so specifically with regard to the group work, the groups worked very effectively, and after two weeks, the first ones they had some minus and plus points on their group ratings, after two weeks, every class after that was zero, zero, zero on all the students. They were all uh, balancing their contributions. They worked, the, one of the beauties of, of, of this kind of problem-based learning is that groups can work at their own speed. Students can learn at their own speed, which is impossible in a normal class. So the groups worked at quite different paces, and I would let them catch up or, or do things in their own way. And in each group, you'd see certain students taking on the role of teacher and helping the other students. So th that peer interaction was really great. And I got a chance to address lots of concepts, misconceptions that I just never had chance to before. The quizzes, Socrative has really been a revelation for me. I'm now using it in everything. It's, ch it's changed the way I teach entirely. Um, but what was really good from a, from, a, from a content point of view was I could put up a question, I get the feedback, and the, and the, and the student response was nearly always like 90% correct, a few wrong answers. And then occasionally I'd get a question and it would be, I'd, I'd have say four multiple choice answers, they'd be 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%, percent and I thought, they've not understood this at all. And then I could address that on the board right then and there. So I didn't waste any time talking about things the students already knew, and I could focus on the things that they really struggled with, which was great. Um, and also, and the, the other thing that this has been wonderful about was I could use Socrative to find out what the students were thinking. How many times do you say to your class, so what do you think about this? Should I do this? And, and one hand will go up or everyone sits there. You get no feedback. I could instantly get a response on everything. So, um, so let, let me just show you some very quick, I'm sorry, I'm going to run over slightly, but let's, uh, let me just show you some responses. So uh, after the first time they'd watched the videos, I asked them this question, how was your experience of watching your first flipped classroom lecture outside class? You can see the response is just as good as listening to a live lecture, better than a live lecture because I could pause and rewind, go at my own pace, rewatch sections, etc. A good experience, but I prefer a real lecture. A poor experience, I found it hard due to the quality. A poor experience because I got distracted or I didn't watch the video. And the first, this, this was the response. All right, so 72% of the students in, the, in my second class said that they liked the, the lectures, the videos, better than uh, a live lecture. And it, there was pretty even distribution either side of that. So this gave me confidence to carry on with the course because uh, I, I, there was a clear kind of uh, good reaction to that. So some of the reactions here, uh, I just, uh, overall I found the course very interesting, quite interesting, quite boring. Okay, this is about the ex distribution I probably expect for students, some of whom really aren't interested in chemistry. Um, the difficulty level of the course, again, most of it came out as a little too difficult, which is exactly what I was aiming for. If students tell you they think it's at the right level, then it should be a bit harder. Um, the, the amount of material was a little too much, which again, <laughs> was what I was aiming for there. Um, and in this course, uh, this is quite interesting. I learned a lot of new things. I learned a few new things. I learned nothing new, or I forgot things I used to know. <laughs> so I, I, in the class, I was quite surprised by, by the number of students who said they forgot things they used to know. And when I dug into the data, actually, two of the students there actually clicked A and D, or B and D. Uh, the system allowed them to choose two. So, only one student actually said, I forgot things I used to know, and, which was still a surprise to me. Um, compared to a conventional lecture course, I feel that the flipped classroom helped me understand, th this is right at the end of the course, so helped me understand them more deeply or, or was no different uh, than the other course. Again, some students said meant that I understood the material less deeply, 
Uh, but again, there were some uh, double clicks from A and C uh, on that, which was a little bit strange. Um, in terms of Pogil, did I find the, the, this class, these Pogil worksheets useful? Very much yes. How about the in-class quizzes? Really incredibly strongly yes. And uh, the wiki online textbook, mm, a kind of mixed response. And, and, and I think there are some good reasons for that, and, and, and it's not ideal. And I might offer a, 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 the option of a, a, of a purchase test books as well next time. Um, so some very quickly, some comments from the student. I asked the students what their favorite aspect of the course was. Um, group work, I think it really helped because sometimes I didn't understand. OK, I want to go through all of these. They liked the videos, uh, being able to replay the videos, um, and they like the quantum mechanics part, they like the quizzes, and they, they really like the group work. Lots of them said the group work was great, the group work was great. L lots of those uh, responses. I also asked them how the course could be improved. Um, so some of them don't like the long lectures. Some of them said, I fell asleep. Uh, now, I'm not going to take that as a reaction not to do it, because I think they're in completely capable of pausing, stopping, doing it another time. And, and, and breaking it into chunks will really interrupt the flow of the material. So I have no intention of changing that. Uh, some of them wanted me to mix the groups up. That's interesting. Maybe uh, it's worth thinking about. Um, some of them wanted harder homework, <laughs> uh, oddly. Um, and so actually, this was, this was the one I put in for you. Um, div uh, Divide up the videos into smaller chunks so it will not drift off to sleep while watching them. Also, for have, for example, recitation videos like the MIT Open Courseware so that we can consolidate our knowledge and know what are the important concepts that should be memorized. In fact, the MIT OCW videos are incredibly useful and easy to understand <laughs> in general. So this course should perhaps be modeled after them. So I'm <laughs> uh, I, I still have a long way to go, clearly, in, in getting this right. Um, so very, very finally, just to show you, uh, these are the exam. The exam was kept the same. The, 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 other, the total mark for the course was evaluated in a different way, but I deliberately kept the exam the same every year so I could check that they hadn't all gone downhill or anything. Here's, here's the marks, actually. Now, the, the, the exam is quite hard, and uh, the typical scores were around 50%, until Claire's year, who were a phenomenally odd bunch and did in astonishingly well. They, almost every student in the class did, did well that year. So this year, with the, with the flipped classroom, I, I have a considerable movement up from there. Um, and this, this, time, this class, I had got all the extra workshops and all the lunchtime sessions, which I didn't need for this. So I think I read that as, as, as quite good. It certainly has is, is, is not had any negative impact uh, on the teaching. Um, all right, so I'm sorry I've gone on so long. Let me, let me finish off. For me, th this is the, one of the best things I've ever done in my education. It was, it was fantastic for me. Uh, I was really delighted with it. it. It really brought me great pleasure in doing the class sessions because I could really talk to the students, engage with them, and understand their problems. The students, to me, and uh, you heard this, you know, they, they, it was kind of transformed. The students spent so much more time thinking deeply about in key concepts. I really think they were much more engaged with the material than they ever were in my class before. Uh, I understood their relationships with the concepts much better, and I could focus on the areas they struggled with and not on the areas that they, were, that they already found easy. Uh, and students who took that course, since in my other courses that are not flipped, have said to me, come on, flip your course. It was much better. Um, so it's now in my intention to flip all my uh, undergraduate chemistry courses uh, when I can. Um, but there's still room for improvement, all right? There, as I think as a first, a first step, it went really well. I'm very pleased with it, but I need to keep learning from this and refining uh, the activities, refining the materials. Okay, so sorry for going over, and thank you so much uh, for your kind of attention.